Sup, Chooms. So as some of you guys may know, I am a big proponent of the use of finasteride in the treatment of male pattern baldness, and for good reason. It is the only treatment for antrenic alopecia that has been clinically proven to be effective in both the short and long term. Furthermore, finasteride is not just a very effective treatment, but it's also an extremely safe treatment. Its side effect profile is very mild, and even for those few people who do get side effects, those side effects will usually go away on their own with continued use, and even if they don't, those side effects can easily be mitigated through titration adjustments like using the drug every other day or using smaller doses like half or quarter of a milligram as opposed to just the one milligram standard dose. It is for this reason why for most people using finasteride alone is all they will ever need to do. And what could be better than just taking a pill every day or every other day to keep your hair loss under control? I mean, it sounds like a pretty good deal and it sounds like something that's very easy to adhere to. I mean, we know finasteride works because it inhibits the 5A reductase enzyme in particular what it inhibits is the type 2 enzyme, which is active on the scalp, which is what converts the good main male hormone testosterone into the shitty old man trash hormone dihydrotestosterone, which of course what is what causes hair loss in men who are genetically predisposed to androgenic alopecia. And although finasteride has by far the most research backing its efficacy as a hair loss pharmaceutical, I mean it is an FDA approved drug after all, there are also other drugs which work by a similar mechanism to finasteride by suppressing the 5A reductive enzyme and are thus also sometimes used to treat hair loss. The most famous of these finasteride alternatives is dutasteride, which is also known by its trade name Avodart, which unlike finasteride is a soft gel with the uh, liquid drug inside of the soft gel. Now, dutasteride is not FDA approved to treat hair loss, but it is approved in some countries like Good Korea and is often prescribed off-label in Western nations as a hair loss treatment due to the belief that it is stronger than finasteride. Now, as some of you guys may know, I have used dutasteride in the past, and even though I still find it to be effective for treating hair loss, I still prefer finasteride overall. I do not doubt for a moment that dutasteride is probably a stronger drug than finasteride. In fact, there was a meta-analysis out of China from last year that showed in three studies involving 576 patients that dutasteride was more effective than finasteride with similar adverse effects over 24 weeks. This improved efficacy is often erroneously attributed to the fact that dutasteride suppresses the type 2 and type 1 5A reductase enzyme, when in reality it's probably just because dutasteride suppresses more of the type 2 enzyme compared to finasteride since the type 2 enzyme is what is active on the scalp. I mean, the type 1 5A reductase enzyme is more active on the skin and can contribute to skin problems like acne. However, dutasteride has never been proven to be an effective acne treatment, so it may not be very good at suppressing the type 1 5A reductase enzyme either. I mean, the drug's official FDA-approved use is for enlarged prostate, which also has high levels of the type 2 5A reductase enzyme, uh, just like the scalp. So I don't know why dutasteride even suppresses is the type 1 enzyme at all. Maybe it's just an incidental effect of the drug. So even though dutasteride will certainly get the job done for treating hair loss, I prefer finasteride because there are better long-term studies, some done over 10 years, which still show that over 90% of subjects maintain benefits on the drug with no adverse effects. Dutasteride's use for hair loss has never been studied longer than 24 weeks, at least in high-quality studies that I've seen. Also, we know that the type 1 enzyme or isoenzyme is active in the brain along with the type 2, so it seems dutasteride would have a greater risk of causing neurological side effects than just using finasteride, which is extremely well tolerated in the majority of people. So, of course, both finasteride and dutasteride are oral medications. This is well known. But in the case of finasteride, it is sometimes compounded and applied topically based on the belief that it can maintain its effectiveness while reducing the risk of side effects due to less systemic absorption. I did a video comparing oral to topical finasteride, and the bottom line is that the effectiveness of the two treatments were similar, but there was also evidence of systemic absorption of topical finasteride as serum DHT, DHT was suppressed similarly to how it's suppressed with oral finasteride. So I think topical finasteride, while effective, is a little bit redundant since if you're going to have similar systemic absorption, you might as well just take the pill. I mean, that would be much easier than applying a topical to your scalp, especially if you're already using another topical like minoxidil, which I do. Nevertheless, there are people who report responding better to topical uh, finasteride compared to oral finasteride. And, you know, maybe it's due to the placebo, maybe more research is needed. But bottom line is, is that finasteride works whether it is applied topically or orally. 
But what about dutasteride? Many people prefer dutasteride due to the belief it works better, and like finasteride, dutasteride is still generally well tolerated with a low risk of side effects. But what about for the few people who cannot tolerate dutasteride orally? Can it be applied topically and still be effective while at the same time mitigating the risk of side effects? Well, that is what I am here to find out. So fortunately, there is some pretty good research on the subject that has some good news and bad news, so let's go balls deep and break it down. The first study is recent. It is from October 2020, so it's very recent, in fact. The study goes over topical dutasteride, but it isn't just regular dutasteride like you would get if you were to pop open an Avodart soft gel and spread the drug on your skin. This was a specialized formulation of dutasteride, which I'll describe in a moment, but basically the investigators uh, were concerned that the usual preparation of liquid dutasteride would be similar to topical dutasteride in the sense that it would still absorb systemically, thus rendering its topical use pointless. So what they did is they incorporated dutasteride into what are called lipid nanoparticles. These are droplets of lipids or fats with the dutasteride tucked away inside, as you can see in this picture. And if you look at the picture here, it's not that much different from the COVID-19 vaccine, in fact, where they took RNA and put it inside a lipid membrane. The reason for the lipid coating is that the lipid particles form a film on the skin and allow drug penetration into the hair follicles without the drug penetrating the skin and entering into the bloodstream. And just for good measure, they also added lauric acid onto the outside of the particles because lauric acid is thought to maybe have some anti-angiogenic properties. So maybe they thought that adding it, they uh, it would be more effective somehow. I mean, who knows? But for comparison, they also looked at regular dutasteride and alcohol in some, but not all the analyses. So in the study, they described how they created and validated the nanoparticles, which is very complicated. Uh, they then tested the nanoparticles for how the drug was released and whether it could penetrate the skin. So to test the study, they sadly used the skin on pig ears from innocent murdered pigs, which is fucked up, but I guess it's because the pig skin is very similar to human skin. And they also looked at the effects on hair follicles using cultured human hair follicle dermal papilla cells in a petri dish. They also looked at skin irritation using artificial skin called 3D epiderm, which is literally 3D printed human skin, which begs the question, why don't they just use this in place of like the, uh, the pig skin that they acquired? I mean, I don't know. But anyways, they did a number of other analyses as well, but it's complicated. So let's just go ahead and get to the bottom line because, you know, that's what's important after all. They documented that the nanoparticles had a nice slow release with just 55% of the dutasteride released in 24 hours and a slow release is very important because even if a drug does get absorbed systemically, if it is done gradually, then it will not build up to unsafe levels in the bloodstream. And that is why minoxidil is safe when it applied topically, but has more risk when taken orally. Since taken orally, the drug is released all at once as opposed to just being released gradually. But anyways, the researchers found that none of the released dutasteride that was applied topically penetrated the pig ear skin barrier, implying that systemic blood absorption should be minimal. Uh, the nanoparticles also decrease cell toxicity to the dermal papilla cells versus using just the regular dutasteride solution alone. And there was also less skin irritation with the lipid coated nanoparticles than using the regular dutasteride solution alone. So to summarize everything, the preparation of dutasteride in lipid coated, uh, lipid -coated nanoparticles as opposed to dutasteride in an alcohol solution did seem to keep the dutasteride on the scalp, uh, causing it to penetrate into the hair follicles, but not through the skin into the blood stream with a very good slow release and very minimal cell toxicity or irritation. And it's important to note that this study did not look at efficacy of dutasteride for hair growth. They were interested in finding a preparation that would not be absorbed systemically. So this was just purely an in vitro study. Clearly, the next step would be to do animal or even human studies to measure things like serum dutasteride levels and dihydrotestosterone levels to prove there is no absorption and to prove that the drug works at least comparably to oral dutasteride. And even assuming topical dutasteride in a nanoparticle form works with no systemic absorption, who knows how much this technique would cost and how practical it would be in real life. In any case, this treatment is not available, and if it is ever made available, it will likely be patented and prohibitively expensive. So in the meanwhile, the only option people have when it comes to topical dutasteride is to make their own topical dutasteride formula, of which there has not been any good studies on, so there's no way to ascertain data on its safety and efficacy compared to oral dutasteride. There's also a 2011 study 
her patients applied a topical lotion called NUH Hair, and what it is is some shitty proprietary treatment which contains tutasteride, minoxidil, finasteride, and other compounds over the course of nine months, which yielded some significant hair growth, but the sample size was only 15 patients, and it's impossible to determine how effective the tutasteride was since it was paired with two other clinically proven treatments, and we don't know how much of the drug was in the formula used by the subjects, and there was no control group either, and some of the patients were even already on on uh, other treatments like oral finasteride. So the study is pretty much completely bunk. So no valuable data there either. And sadly, overall, there's not a lot of data on topical dutasteride. You know, maybe it works, but if we're assuming there is systemic absorption, such as in the case with topical finasteride, and someone applying dutasteride topically for the purpose of bypassing some of these potential side effects may not be so lucky. So is there any effective way to use dutasteride other than orally? Well, there is another known way to take tutasteride, and no, don't worry, I'm not talking about some sort of suppository. I am, in fact, talking about something called mesotherapy, and this is when dutasteride is injected directly into the scalp, and this is a fairly new means of application, but there is still some research on it. So, in a study out of Egypt from 2009, they first tried doing mesotherapy with finasteride. However, for some reason, patients complained of severe pain, so they can never get together any kind of treatment group since finasteride couldn't be applied without severe discomfort, so they then got the idea to try injecting dutasteride instead. Fortunately, in the case of dutasteride, uh, the dutasteride didn't cause as much pain, so they were able to actually complete the study. So this was a single-blind placebo-controlled study, meaning the patients didn't know whether they were getting placebo or the active drug, though the investigators did, so overall very good methodology in the study. There were 34 patients aged 20 to 50 with antritic alopecia ranging from 3 to 5 on the Norwood scale, and all were off any hair growth meds for at least 6 months, so we know they weren't taking anything that could influence the outcome of the study. So, good Good controls put in place here. The patients were divided into two groups. One group got a preparation of 0.05% dutasteride that also contains some other compounds like D-pentanol, biotin, and uh, pyridoxine. And unfortunately, they couldn't just use regular pure dutasteride because it wasn't available to them in Egypt for some reason. I mean, possibly because dutasteride contains gelatin, which comes from pigs whose consumption is forbidden in Islamic culture. I don't know. That's just speculation on my part. But anyways, the other group, the control group, just got a saline solution. The injections in the groups were delivered to the vertex of the scalp for four weeks, then every two weeks for two times, then one last injection after another four weeks. A week later, hair growth was assessed. The injections were 0.05 milliliters each, one centimeter apart, with up to 1.5 to 2 milliliters each session, which by my math indicates up to 40 injections each week. Ouch. Screw that. I'd rather just pop a finasteride and be done with it. But anyways, to measure progress, they use hair counts, independent blinded observer assessment of global photographs, and patient self-assessment to determine the results. So, what were the results? Well, six patients dropped out, four because of the pain and injections, leaving 28 patients who completed the study, which isn't a huge sample size, but the methodology was still very good overall, as I already said. Hair counts showed that in the placebo group, they decreased by 0.173 hairs per one centimeter diameter area, while dutasteride increased hair counts by about eight hairs. So a pretty substantial improvement overall. Independent observer eval evaluation of photos showed 93% of dutasteride group improved, whereas only 29% of the placebo group improved. Improved. And patient self-assessment showed improvement in 93% with dutasteride versus only 7% with saline. Hair quality and hair thickness were also improved with dutasteride via the patient assessment. And you guys can look at these photos and do your own assessments if you want, but here you go. So... Now we get into the big question, which is why many people avoid oral dutasteride to begin with, but what about the side effects, bro? Well, all patients in both groups complained of pain from injections, which is no surprise, but again, only four were big enough pussies that they actually dropped out of the study completely. Fortunately, there were no complaints of sexual side effects, but you know, remember, this is a small study, only about 28 people or so, and side effects with dutasteride like finasteride are rare to begin with, so it would take a much larger study to get an understanding of the side effect prevalence of the drug. So even if its side effects are similar to oral dutasteride, you probably need like hundreds of subjects to determine the incidence of side effects. So, you know, like I said, 28 is just too few people to determine just how prevalent side effects are. I mean, it's very possible that you can have 28 people and none of them will get side effects, even though side effects are a possibility. So 
any, in any case, even with the small sample size, it does seem to test dry when it's administered by scalp injection does work to cause hair growth. I mean, it's not a huge surprise. I mean, as if anything, it's an even more potent 5-AR blocker than finasteride. However, the whole point of giving dutasteride topically is to avoid systemic absorption, right? Well, unfortunately, it is probable there is considerable systemic absorption if you inject into the scalp. I mean, after all, the scalp is highly vascular. I mean, if you don't believe me, go ahead and take a scalpel to it, and I guarantee you it will bleed, and that's something I remind people of whenever they bring up the blood flow theory. So I don't think scalp injections, aka mesotherapy, is a very practical means of fighting hair loss. I mean, do I think it works? Probably. But who in the hell would want to get 40 injections per week? I mean, hell, who even wants to get one injection per week, especially in the scalp? I mean, I'd rather just take a pill and get on with my day. Now, as for applying it topically, uh, maybe if they ever develop uh, treatment from the first study I mentioned, which used that whole lipid-coated nanoparticle thing, I'd consider it. I mean, especially if subsequent tests show that it really works and is safe. But for now, why even bother? I mean, we already have a phenomenal treatment in oral finasteride. And I know a lot of people are tempted to try dutasteride because they think it is a bit stronger. But I firmly believe that finasteride is good enough for most people. And most people who think they need to upgrade to dutasteride are doing so erroneously, such as confusing an initial shed from finasteride for inefficacy of the drug. I mean, maybe dutasteride would be a good choice for hair loss veterans who have been on finasteride for 10 years or so, and they feel the drug isn't as effective anymore as it used to be. But even the chances of that happening are very low, because as has been proven before, and as I have documented in my video talking about long-term use of finasteride, finasteride is effective in over 90% of patients, even after 10 years of usage. And keep in mind, the study that I'm referencing had like well over 500 people in it. I mean, no other treatment comes close to having data that comprehensive over such a long period of time. I mean, who knows what kind of effects dutasteride would have after 10 years, especially since it suppresses the type 1 5A reductase enzyme, which is, which is present in the central nervous system. So I'm not doing that the fear monger. I'm just trying to say that the long-term effects of finasteride are better documented than the long-term effects of dutasteride, whose effectiveness isn't well studied past 24 weeks. So bottom line is, you know, I am a fan of innovation. You know, I like the idea of finding different solutions to common problems. I mean, that's a good thing. But in the case of hair loss, I do feel that people tend to overthink things. I mean, for the overwhelming majority of people, we don't need topical dutasteride. We don't need mesotherapy. We don't need nanoparticle-derived solutions. The fact of the matter is, is that there already is, in a sense, a cure for male pattern baldness. It's called getting on finasteride before losing any hair to begin with. I mean, will this solution work for absolutely everybody? No, of course not. There's no such thing as a perfect treatment. But will it work for most people? Hell yes, it will. And we know this because it has been clinically proven to be both safe and effective in the majority of people, the overwhelming majority of people. I mean, you don't have to look to the horizon and hope that something comes out to save your hair before you go bald. You just need to look past all the slaphead propaganda and realize we already have a fantastic treatment with finasteride that will work in over 90% of people who use it. And for those few where finasteride isn't enough, they can also use minoxidil too. I mean, the finasteride plus minoxidil combo is considered the gold standard for treating hair loss for a good reason, and that is because it works. It works extremely well. So, if you are going bald, don't even think about any theoretical or experimental treatments on the horizon. Just get on what is proven to work, and don't assume it's not working for you just because you get a shed initially, or because you're not getting some miraculous re regrowth where your hair goes back to where it was when you were a teenager if you start treatment when you're in Norwood 3. I mean, for most of us, just stop any, stopping any further further hair loss is the best thing we can hope for, which again is why the best thing you can possibly do is just to start treatment before losing any ground to begin with. And if you uh, are not getting the kind of regrowth you want, then you can at least maintain your hair with pharmaceutical treatments and you can save up for something like an FUE hair transplant in the future and uh, regain any lost Norwood levels you have. But you know, that's any, that's, that's all I want to say about the subject. And, um, with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and just go back to Night City and play some more Cyberpunk 2077. I'm enjoying the hell out of the game. I mean, it's too soon to tell you guys whether or not it's my game of the year, but it's definitely up there. And, you know, I know there are, like, reports of bugs and glitches, but it's not as bad as... Um, what well, was initially reported, and you know, since that time, there's been several patches put into place. So the game's not that bad. It's actually really, really good, despite some of the bugs. I mean, it's no worse than like how Skyrim was at launch. But anyways, I'll see you guys next time.